sort of a story. One example. Remember what organism it was that we were looking at? It's a flower example. So what was it about the incompletely dominant offspring? They had an intermediate phenotype. There's an intermediate phenotype. So last class. So in this case, this recipient cell is getting maybe half as much signal as it normally would because it's half of its cell surface receptors are wild type. So maybe there's an intermediate phenotype. You could argue that. Or you could say, as I just did in the summary a couple minutes ago, that, well, this cell is receiving some signal, so maybe it's recessive. If you had both of the mutations, if both of these alleles were blue, and you had absolutely no of the black sort of rounded receptor molecules, and 100% of the ones on the cell surface were that squarish shaped receptor, then no signaling would occur from one cell to the other, and that would definitely have a recessive phenotype. So the point here is we talked about loss of function and gain of function last class. This is an example of a loss of function mutation where a mutation, in this case the blue mutation, causes the receptor to stop functioning. It loses its function, and those tend to be recessive mutations. So if you read something that says that a function that used to exist no longer exists because of a mutation, then usually it's reasonable to predict it's recessive. about white flowers, this is one of the examples, and red flowers, and when they were crossed, you can get examples of pink flowers, although I don't have the color pink easily at hand here, so I'm just going to write that in. Pink being intermediate between the white parent and the red parent. That was incomplete dominance. Where the hybrid looks something like an intermediate or an average or something like that of the two parents. Last class, the other Socrative we need to talk about. At the end of last class, I showed you this pedigree, and I asked you if you thought it was a dominant pattern or a recessive pattern. 42 of you voted, yes, this looks dominant, and one said, no, this does not look dominant. So it's dominant because the disease, filled in symbols, whatever, phenotype, it doesn't have to be disease, shows up in every generation. That tends to be a dominant sort of pattern. If this is dominant, what's the genotype of the affected parent? If we're using, and today we will, plus will indicate a wild type allele. And we'll use minus for the mutant allele, be it dominant or recessive. So what would be the genotype of this individual if this is dominant? This is the affected individual? They'll either be... Plus, plus, or plus, minus. Well, plus, plus is what phenotype? Plus is the wild type allele, so plus, plus would be unaffected. So if this is dominant, the unaffected parent's definitely plus, plus, because if it was dominant and that parent had a minus allele, then they would be a filled-in symbol. Because if it's dominant, it only takes one dominant mutation to cause whatever phenotype it is we're looking at. So the genotype of the black circle, the mom, is either plus over minus or minus over minus. Right? They either have one mutant allele, they have both mutant alleles. Can we tell the difference? Can we use any information in this pedigree to try to predict what mom's genotype is? Just a second. What information do we have on there besides the parents' phenotypes to try to predict what's happening in the next generation? Whether it's autosomal or uh, sex-linked. But we don't know that because that was something we'd want to know, but this is affecting all of the offspring equally, males and females. Oh, right. So. So since there are four children, the likelihood of it being um, homozygous in one of the parents is more likely because when you do a um, Mendelian genetics Punnett square, um, 
the likelihood of it affecting more than 25% is more, well, I don't know how to explain it, hmm. but Punnett Square. Punnett Square. Yes. Okay. So all of the offspring are affected. Does that look more like the mom is homozygous? What would be true if the mom was homozygous for the mutation? What would be true about all of her kids? If this is dominant, they would all have the phenotype. Do they all have the phenotype? Yes. So that makes it look like maybe the probability of mom being homozygous mutant is bigger because all of her kids got the mutation. But what would this look like if the mom was heterozygous? What would her kids look like? So we'd have to do a Punnett square. So we put dad across the top. We know that the dad is, if this is dominant, then dad has to be plus over plus. And if we're predicting that mom is plus over minus, then half of the kids should be affected and half not. You have 50% of the kids being homozygous and 50% of the kids down here at the bottom being heterozygous. So half the kids would be affected. So maybe it would look like that. One son, one daughter affected. One son, one daughter not affected. So are those two things? The big question, the chi-square question, is are those two statistically significantly different? And you could do a chi-square test and find out. And in this case, it turns out we can't rule out which genotype that parent has, the mom. I think. Let's see, so what would the chi-square test look like? Someone set up that chi-square test for us. We're going to have observed values and expected values. What are our categories? Okay, affected and unaffected. So we observed four affected, zero unaffected. We expect two and two. So is that p-value? Bigger or smaller than 0.05 after you do the chi-square test. It is. So I hope you'll work it through, but this is actually statistically significantly different. Observing four kids that are all affected rules out, statistically speaking, the probability that the mom is heterozygous. That is, it would be unlikely, there's a less than 5% chance that if the mom was heterozygous, every time one of her oocytes, eggs, was used in fertilization, that they all had the minus of her minus or plus. Three in a row is not statistically significant, but four out of four becomes P less than 0.05. So in this case, we can statistically predict the genotype of the mom just based on the data in the pedigree. That doesn't mean she is homozygous. It just means it's statistically significantly unlikely that she's heterozygous. And this is why we talk about the chi-square test in genetics so much, because we use it in all sorts of situations, including in pedigree analysis. But then, you know, you might wonder why I'm spending so much time talking about this, because 42 of you agreed that this looked like a dominant pattern anyway. And it was more split when I asked for the same pedigree, is this recessive? Now, I didn't ask, is it recessive? I asked, could this be a recessive pattern? Yes, it can. So for the 24 of you that said, no, this couldn't be recessive, maybe some of you are not in attendance today, how could this be recessive? What would have to be true if this is a recessive 
trait. It's recessive, so what does that mean about dad in this pedigree? Dad has to be heterozygous, which we also call, for recessive mutations, a heterozygote is called a carrier. Dad has to be a carrier if this is recessive, which means dad is plus over minus half filled in symbol, indicating that that individual doesn't have the phenotype, the disease, or whatever it is that we're looking at, but has the ability to pass it on to all of his kids. So this could be a recessive phenotype. Maybe it's not as likely as this being dominant, but it's possible. Maybe even if it's statistically unlikely, it still could be. And that's why, I hope, when you do pedigree analysis, you won't stop at saying this phenotype shows up every generation, therefore it's dominant. Because that logic works most of the time, but there are some instances where you will see a phenotype in two sequential generations, one after the next, when it's not dominant, and this would be one example. Questions? Yeah. So could be heterozygous, but Yes. Could be dominant. Could still be dominant and have be right? Correct. So you can be heterozygous for a dominant mutation. The reason we don't call that a carrier is because the heterozygote for a dominant mutation shows the phenotype, so we know that they have at least one of the mutant alleles. So it'll always be expressed because it's not. Because it's dominant. Right, so carrier necessarily is the term we use just for heterozygotes with a recessive mutation. Because they look normal, phenotypically, we just don't know what their genotype is until they have kids. And if they have kids that are affected, that tells us that the parent that doesn't have the disease must at least have one copy of the gene that they can pass on that causes that disease or trait. So is it more likely recessive or dominant? Recessive. Well, what did we, yeah, what did the statistical test about dominance suggest? It could either be, it could be one of two things. There isn't actually a most likely inheritance pattern, and that's the point of this, is that this individual could be homozygous for a dominant mutation, or they could be homozygous for a recessive along with a carrier male. So those are the two different genotypes we just looked at. They're both possible. You can't rule either of them out at this point. This is a prime example of how in genetics and in biology in general, there is not always one right answer to every question especially for pedigree analysis. There are some times when we just don't have enough information to know for sure. So for an excellent dominant trait, let's take a look at one possible inheritance pattern. So I didn't get to these last time. So if a male has an X-linked trait, how many X chromosomes does a male have? One. Normally, one. So his genotype, if this is X dominant, what's his genotype for the X chromosome? He's got a mutant X chromosome. And then what else? A normal Y chromosome. A Y. And the thing about the Y chromosome, which we're not, I'm not going to write Y here as part of the genotype. Normally, these are Y over 
or x over zero, x over null, because the y chromosome doesn't have the genes that the x chromosome has most of the time. Most of the genes on the X chromosome don't exist on the Y chromosome. That's really important. The male only has one X chromosome. So if this is a dominant mutation, then the minus means the male gets the trait. And we've got, let's say, in the other family, the female has the disease. So let's say the female in this case, is plus over minus. They're heterozygous for a dominant mutation. So what fraction of her kids are going to get the bad X chromosome? Over here. This couple has four kids. How many of them are going to inherit mom's minus half. on average? Half are going to get the minus. Half are going to get the plus. Which sexes are going to get mom's good or bad X? Male. Both. For the males, for sure. Right. Only get one. Well, so every kid gets one X from mom. So it doesn't matter. There's no sex bias in X-linked inheritance in, from moms, because every kid is going to get one of her X's. So that son could get a plus. Daughter could get a minus, son could get a minus, daughter could get a plus. Why is that? What did they get from dad? Dad's, if this is dominant and dad's wild type phenotype, then he's plus over plus. Except he doesn't have a plus. He's got a what? He doesn't have an X chromosome. So what do I write here? Zero. So which X, where did the X chromosomes from dad go? These ones. The fertilization, who gets the X's? Wait, what's, his, what's the other chromosome he's got? This is, this is the sex chromosome we're looking at. So it's X and Y. So the males all get dad's Y. So remember that zero means zero X's, which is the same thing as writing Y. So he's got an X and a Y, so all the males, all the sons of dad get nothing, no, no X chromosome. So all of his daughters get his X chromosome. Dad's gametes are the ones that really define the sexes of the offspring, male or female. So if this is X linked dominant, which one of those four individuals which ones or one of those four individuals is going to have this disease? If, it's, if the minus is dominant. The two in the middle. Everybody that's got a minus, that daughter and that son, have this mutation or have this phenotype. So it's, that's a normal looking inheritance pattern for a dominant, dominant disease. We've got a heterozygote. And it goes to half of the kids. And it doesn't matter which sex the kids are. Males and females are equally affected. It's the other side of the pedigree that you have focus on to determine X dominant inheritance. What happens when a dad passes the mutation on, when males do? So in this, on the left side, then, how does dad pass the mutant X chromosome on to his kids? There's a pattern here that emerges. Dad passes his ex to all of his son or daughters. And because he passes what to his sons? The y. the y from dad goes to all of his sons. So all the males are going to be normal. Because if the mom is open circle, that mean, and this is dominant, that means she would have a plus over plus genotype. If she was heterozygous, she'd have the disease. She'd be filled in. So dad passes his... Y chromosome to all of his sons, which means he passes the bad X to all of his daughters. And they all get pluses from mom because she's heterozygous. Mom is homozygous. Yes, thanks. Thank you. So in this case, all of the daughters of the affected male are affected. 
they're all heterozygotes, but this, if this is dominant, then heterozygote is all that you need to be effective. So affected male passing to all daughters is a typical trait of X-linked to dominant mutations. Moms pass it on like a normal dominant, an autosomal dominant disease. X-linked recessive. Say just one of the parents in generation one, the mom, has an X-linked if this is X-linked recessive. We never know in advance, of course. That's what we're trying to figure out. I'm just telling you in advance, let's draw something that looks X-linked recessive. Mom's genotype, if it's recessive, has to be minus over minus. And what's the dad's genotype on the left side? This is X-linked, so it's something over zero. So what's his X chromosome? Good or bad? Plus, it's wild type. Here's the really important thing about X-linked recessives. If a male's affected, now this is recessive. It takes two bad versions of the mutation to show the trait. So what's dad's chromosomal genotype for the X and the Y if the dad is affected by the disease or phenotype? Um, Something over zero. Negative. Has to be minus over zero. Plus over zero we know is wild type. Plus over Y, that is X over Y. So why is it that in this case dad is affected by this disease or phenotype it's a recessive disease, but he's only got one minus, not two minuses. It has to do with the mother. It has to do with why recessive diseases normally act like they're recessive. Because on the Y chromosome, there's not enough genetic data to, I guess what I would say, counteract the X chromosome stuff. So they're technically not like, you know, matching. Exactly. Yeah. So the Y chromosome does not have a wild type allele of whatever this gene is if it's on the X. So males tend to be susceptible to recessive X-linked traits and show them more frequently because we don't even have the chance to have to be heterozygotes. We only get one X chromosome and if it's got a recessive mutation on it, it's called recessive because it's recessive in women. Women could be plus over minus. They could be carriers. But in males, that minus is exposed because there's no wild type version of that gene on the Y. So any X-linked trait that's recessive shows up. Is, if it's in a male, if that X chromosome goes into a male, the male shows that trait. In that sense, here's what the next generation looks like. All of the males are going to be affected for that exact reason. They're all minus over nothing, which means even though they only have one minus, whatever gene that is, that minus mutation has rendered that gene useless. It's not working. And there's no backup copy, because there's no other X chromosome that could have the wild type version of that gene. What do all the daughters in this cross look like? They all get, they all get a minus from mom, guaranteed, because mom's homozygous. And they're all guaranteed a plus from dad, because that's his only X chromosome. And they get the only X chromosome that dad had, which was wild type. So they're all heterozygotes. They're all carriers.
So that's the, that's the situation for X-linked recessives. Affected moms will pass them to 100% of their sons. And all daughters are carriers. They're heterozygous. So how do you distinguish an autosomal recessive trait from an X-linked recessive trait? What's the key difference between them? There's a sex bias here. Affected moms pass to all sons and no daughters. At least all of her sons are affected and none of her daughters are affected. What would it look like if it was autosomal recessive? It affects all this, both sexes equally. So you'd have half sons affected, half sons carriers, half daughters are affected, and the other half of the daughters would be carriers. So really, comparing recessives, X versus autosomal, you're just looking for that sex effect. Is one sex exclusively affected and not the other, or is it mixed? Yeah. Is this like the discussion that we just submitted? Right. This is like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. It's more frequent in males than females because males only have one X chromosome. When they inherit that muted, mutated X chromosome, they get muscular dystrophy. It takes two mutant X chromosomes for a woman to get it, so they're less frequent. That's why colorblind males are more common than colorblind females. The same thing. I've got a mutant X chromosome. It means I can't distinguish red versus green. Thanks, Grandpa, <laughs> who passed it through my mom to me. My mom's not colorblind because she's got a normal X chromosome to go with her mutant X chromosome. Yeah, I know. Family of mutants. Y-linked traits. The, next, the last two are really easy. What's the Y-linked inheritance pattern? Men only. Men only. Because only men or males have Y chromosomes. So it passes from dads to all sons but never to daughters. So in this case, if both of the men had this trait, then all of their sons would have the trait, and it would only pass on to the third generation through dad, to all sons, no daughters. So that's a pretty easy one to spot. Only men are affected. It's because there's a mutation on the only genetic material that's common just to men, which is the Y chromosome, not X chromosomes, not autosomes. In contrast, what's the opposite type of inheritance pattern? There is no opposite type of inheritance pattern. There's no inheritance pattern where only women get the disease. There's Y-linked, where all men pass it from dad to all sons to all sons to all sons. But there is this other curious inheritance pattern called cytoplasmic inheritance. You know what the cytoplasm is? What is What's in the cell that's not cytoplasm? The, the organelles. The organelles. Okay, what organelles, what DNA is in the cytoplasm versus the nucleus? We've got nuclear DNA and we've got DNA in our cytoplasm too. Mitochondrial DNA? Right. Our organelles have their own genomes, which is weird, and maybe you never heard that before. But if that's a cell... In the nucleus, we've got nuclear chromosomes, which are the ones we've been talking about all semester. But you can also have things like mitochondria, which also have their own genomes. And in case of mitochondria, their genomes are circular, like bacteria. And that's because mitochondria used to be bacteria until an ancestral eukaryotic cell sort of engulfed it and enslaved it and turned that bacteria into a battery, basically. So ancestral pro... You know, a prokaryotic cell basically enslaves bacteria. The bacteria becomes an organelle, and it starts making power energy for that cell. So cytoplasmic organelles have DNA, so they can be inherited too. <laughs> Cytoplasmic inheritance. At fertilization, 
I mean, sperm meets egg. Dad's got DNA in the sperm. In the offspring, what is the source of the cytoplasm of the embryo? Which parent does it come from? The mother. The mom. Because that's where the cytoplasm is. It's the egg. The oocyte has a nucleus and cytoplasm. The sperm is quite literally a nuclear missile because it only carries a nucleus and not much else. And it's the thing that's trying to shoot at the egg and fertilize it. Nuclear missile, right? So cytoplasm comes just from mom. So what if there's a mutation in the DNA that's in the cytoplasm? Like you've got mutant mitochondrial DNA. That, if present in a male, won't be passed on to his kids because the dad doesn't transmit any cytoplasm, including mitochondria, to his offspring because at fertilization, the only thing that gets delivered is the nuclear DNA, or almost never transmits it to his kids. Most of the time, 99.999% of the time, if mom's affected, if she's got a mutation in her mitochondrial DNA, who does she pass it to? All of her children. All of her kids. Because every one of those oocytes has mitochondria in it. And all of those mitochondria, or at least some of them maybe, carry that mutation. So it goes from mom to 100% of kids. And from mom, in generation two, to all of her kids. So this could look like a really, really, really rare example of a homozygous dominant mutation, except for you will never see, and this is what makes this not a dominant mutation, that dads will never pass it to any of their kids. So that's sort of the critical clue you look for to distinguish cytoplasmic from a regular autosomal or X-linked dominant. Mom will always pass it on if she's got it. Dad never will. Huh, that's a lot. So autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, X-linked recessive, Y-linked. Cytoplasm. And that brings us full circle to last class's start of class Socrative activity, where I asked you for this pedigree, what are the possible inheritance patterns? And this is the distribution of your responses. Many of you answered multiple things, so this is not one response for each of you, X-linked dominant was the most common, followed by autosomal dominant, then autosomal recessive, X-recessive, Y-linked, and cytoplasmic. Is this cytoplasmic? No. Could this be cytoplasmic inheritance? No. no. Why not? Because it's from the father. Right. So it can't be cytoplasmic because dad doesn't pass on cytoplasm. In this case, it's the father that's affected, so it can't be cytoplasmic. Which of the other five can we rule out immediately? Y-linked. Why? Why not? <laughs> right, so in this case, it's not passing from fathers to all sons. It's passing from, in this case, it looks like fathers to all daughters. So it can't be Y-linked, because that would be males to males only. Does there appear to be a sex bias here? Yes. And is that possibly by chance? That's something we'd have to do a chi-square test to figure out. But in the meantime, what does the fathers to daughters pattern look like? Does that point to one or the other more likely? That's a good place to start. So if this was X-linked, 
Would it be dominant or recessive? That is, can we rule one out at this point? So if it's dominant, and it's x-linked, what would dad's genotype have to be? Minus, he's got a mutation on the X chromosome. That's why he's got the disease. And then he's got a Y. So he would pass the mutant X chromosome to all of his daughters and none of his sons. So that would make sense. So maybe it's actually dominant. What if it was, so it could be X dominant, and that's what a lot of you chose. What other options do we have, though? Could it be X-linked recessive? So in red, what if it's X-linked recessive? Dad's genotype is still minus over nothing. He's got the disease because he's got one mutant copy of the X, but even though it's recessive, it shows up in the father because he's got no wild-type version of the gene on the Y. So what would have to be true if, if this was recessive? What would have to be true, bless you, about the mom? She'd have to be a carrier. That's the only way to get mutations from both parents into the kids to have affected kids. So mom would have to be plus over minus. So dad gives his Y to all of his sons and his mutation to all of his daughters. And then mom passes the plus or the minus to who? It's, she's got two X's. She gives them to her sons and her daughters equally. So then there's a random distribution of pluses and minuses. If we're looking at children, it's half and half. But here there's a sex bias where she clearly, if it's X recessive, passed the minus to all the kids that are affected and a plus to all of the males. That's why they would be not affected, open circles. So that's possible. It could be X recessive. What would you have to do to know for sure if it was X recessive, if it was possible to be X linked recessive. You'd have to do a chi square test, which maybe we'll talk about next class or maybe we won't, to ask is it chance that the three individuals that were affected are female? Is that just bad luck that all, the only females got this? Or is that a statistically significant pattern? could just be, like it's very possible that it could just be by chance. Well, not. don't say very possible until you do a test, because if you're talking about possibilities, you have to do a chi-square test first. But you're right. It's, both are possible. Or probable, I should say. Yeah. Both are possible. The question is, which one's more likely or more probable? And because we've already covered X-dominant and X-recessive, it's also possible that these are autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. So really, any four of those would be a reasonable answer. We just, just based on this limited amount of data, we can only rule out Y and cytoplasmic. Those are the easy ones. So if you're going to do a probab uh, sorry, probability pedigree analysis, start with the easy ones to rule out first. Look for exceptions. Don't look for patterns. Does dad pass it only to sons? Easy. If not, it's not y -linked. Does mom pass it to all her kids and dads never pass it to their kids? Cytoplasmic. If not, then maybe spend some time working on, OK, is it X or autosome? Don't panic. I just wanted to show a key of my analysis of that pattern 
for the four different possible autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, what the, ex so you can go through this if you want to, don't worry about it if you don't want to. This level of detail won't be on the final, I'm just showing it to you for completeness. For the four different types of patterns that we've not ruled out, dominant, recessive for autosomes, and dominant and recessive for X, I calculated the p-values. So if you want to know how to set up the chi-squares, it's in this key. But none of them are statistically significantly different from chance. That is, all the p-values for this family, for an affected dad, unaffected mom, and three kids, or six kids, three affected, and they're all females, three brothers are not, there's no statistically significant difference in this sex bias pattern. With six kids, three women, three women affected and three males not, or vice versa, three brothers affected and three sisters not, is not statistically significantly different from any of those patterns. Yeah. Just to be clear, it would have to be a p-value of less than point. 0, 0.05 for it to be? So if there's a p-value of less than point zero five, then that would tell you that that's a more likely inheritance pattern. So in this case, none of them are statistically significant, which means we can't rule out, it could be any of these. The best pattern, though, is X dominant. And that's because if you looked in the expected and the observed values, this is the only place where there's a perfect match. Based on what we would predict and what we observe, there should be zero affected sons. There should be three affected daughters, three unaffected sons, three unaffected daughters. That's the only one of these where the expectation and observation are perfect match, which means the p-value is one, which means there's zero chance. I mean, it means that the observed and the expected values are identical. That's what it means. So what is it about this pedigree? A couple minutes left. We'll wrap up just in time. What is it about this pedig pedigree that makes us unable to figure out what kind of an inheritance pattern it is? In other words, why is it hard to be a human geneticist? We don't know if the mother is a carrier. We don't know. So we don't know why the mother's a carrier. Why don't we know if the mother's a carrier? What would be better than this family? If we could make up a human family to study for, for inheritance patterns, what would be better than this? Having one carrier parent and one recessive parent? Well, maybe that is what this is. This could be recessive and it could have a carrier parent. What, do we, what information do we need? We need more kids. We need bigger families so that we get enough data that statistical tests can conclusively determine whether there's a significant difference between expected and observed patterns. So if this family had 12 kids, then we'd have way more data about inheritance patterns. Yeah, woo, yeah. Well, this is one reason, to be perfectly honest, why there are some families in the world that geneticists like to study because they tend to have bigger families. Thoughts? What, what types? What people? There tend, to be some, there tend to be some groups of humans that have larger families and then also have really good genealogical records of their families. So one of them are Mormons. Tend, uh, just stere not a stereotype per se, but it's, an, oh, it's a generalization. Tend to have large families and tend to have really good genealogical records. So a lot of human geneticists like to study those families and Catholics also. At least historically, they've tend to have, some have tended to have larger families that get better statistical significance to study human humans. So, to wrap, those last two slides were try it on your own. So if you want to look at those last two slides, try to figure out which inheritance pattern, this one and the one before. We can talk about that on Wednesday. Last thing then, for Wednesday, we're going to talk about genetically modified organisms after we wrap up any more questions about inheritance patterns. One more fact-checking question about genetically modified mosquitoes. A couple points for find, either describe or take a picture, even better, a food that does not contain DNA. So if, if you go to the cafeteria, go to a restaurant, go home, look in your cupboard, look in your fridge, or something like that, what is something that we consume that does not have DNA? Send a picture or just paste in text on the discussion board. And then one 
video lecture to watch on GMOs. These are the same four surveys I posted last class. If you're willing to finish those, I would appreciate it. It's good feedback for me. I don't look at the answers until after grades are posted, but that'll help me understand how well I've done this term. If One last question. If we've already done the surveys, when will they show up on Canvas point-wise? The surveys will show up on Canvas by the end of consultation days. So probably Saturday I'll have those points posted. And because those are anonymous, I can't know who's doing it. So basically everybody gets all the points. I just wish you would please actually do the surveys because I don't know if you've done them or not because they're anonymous. So out of the kindness of your heart, if you're willing to give me feedback on the structure of the class, I'd love it, but I can't post it. So thank you, and we'll see you Wednesday.